Good afternoon and welcome to our broadcast of the Faribault Community Good Friday service, which was recorded earlier this afternoon at 4th Avenue United Methodist Church in Faribault. Special thanks to Farm Director Jerry Grosskreutz for getting our recording this afternoon. Our program is sponsored by the Keller Insurance Agency in Nearstrand, as well as Pleasant Manor, Pleasant View Estates of Faribault. A good Friday to you all. I'm Pastor Greg Chesluck, and I, on behalf of my congregation and myself, I want to welcome you here to 4th Avenue United Methodist Church. And on behalf of my many clergy colleagues and the other community leaders who are providing uh, leadership in this service, I want to extend a welcome to you to this Good Friday service. It is good to be in the house of the Lord. It's good to be gathered together on this holy day. This service is being recorded by KDHL Radio and will be rebroadcasted this afternoon at 3 p.m. So you can listen on the radio and let others know uh, that that service will be offered uh, at 3 o'clock this afternoon as well. Let me ask you to follow the bulletin as it is provided for you. You can use the red hymnals in the pews to assist you in offering your praises to God. Um, all that you need will be provided as well on the screen. Now, as we, let us prepare our hearts in silent prayer for this celebration on the day we call good. On this holy day of remembrance, we mourn the death of our Lord Jesus Christ. We, Christ. we grieve for the sins that cause God pain. We, we reflect on the little deaths we must die to follow Christ. We, Christ we ponder the depths of God's love. We
Almighty God, look with loving mercy on your family, for whom our Lord Jesus Christ was willing to be betrayed, to be given over to the hands of sinners, and to suffer death on the cross, who now lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, forever and ever. And all God's people say, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. <coughs> going to be reading from the book of Isaiah, chapters 52 through, starting in verse 13 on through the end of chapter 53. See, my servant and act wisely, my servant will act wisely. He will be raised and lifted up and highly exalted. Just as there were many who were appalled at him, his appearance was so disfigured beyond that of any man, and his form marred beyond human likeness. So will he sprinkle many nations, and kings will shut their mouths because of him. For what they were not told they will see, and what they have not heard they will understand. Who has believed our message, and to whom has the arm of the Lord been revealed? He grew up before him like a tender shoot, and like a root out of dry ground. He had no beauty or majesty to attract us to him, nothing in his appearance that we should desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and familiar with suffering. Like one from whom men hid their faces, he was despised and we esteemed him not. Surely he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. Yet we considered him stricken by God, smitten by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace 
was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. He was led like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep before her shears is silent, so he did not open his mouth. By oppression and judgment he was taken away. And who can speak of his descendants? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgression of my people he was stricken. He was assigned a grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, though he had done no violence, nor was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it was the Lord's will to crush him and cause him to suffer. And though the Lord makes his life a guilt offering, he will see his offspring and prolong his days, and the will of the Lord will prosper in his hand. After the suffering of his soul, he will see the light of life and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant will justify many, and he will bear their iniquities. Therefore, I will give him a portion among the great, and he will divide the spoils with the strong, because he poured out his life unto death and was numbered with the transgressors. For he bore the sin of many and made intercession for the transgressors. We will read uh, Psalm 22 responsibly. In you, O Lord, I take refuge. Let me never be put to shame. In your justice, rescue me. Into your hands, I commend my spirit. You will redeem me, O Lord, O faithful God. Father, Father into your hands, I commend my spirit. For all my foes, I am an object of reproach, a laughingstock to my neighbors, and a dread to my friends. They who see me abroad flee from me. I am forgotten like the unremembered dead. I am like a dish that is broken. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. But my trust is in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. In your hands is my destiny. Rescue me from the clutches of my enemies and my persecutors. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. Let your face shine upon your servant. Save me in your kindness. Take courage and be stout-hearted, all you who hope in the Lord. Father, into your hands I commend my spirit. A reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Chapter 10, beginning in verse 16. This is the covenant that I will make with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my laws in their hearts, and I will write them on their minds. I will remember their sins and their lawless deeds no more. For where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer any offering for sin. Therefore, my friends, since we have confidence to enter the sanctuary by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us approach with a true heart in full confidence of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. And let us consider how to provoke one another to love and to do good deeds, not neglecting to meet with one another, as is the habit of some, but rather encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day approaching. Here ends the lesson. 
In the English-speaking world, we call this day Good Friday. But why? On a day when a good man died, a good man who suffered death, the vilest reserved punishment for criminals, do we call it good? Sometimes we emphasize the senseless suffering of Jesus rather than on the purposeful humiliation of God through which redemption comes. Many believe the Good Friday word name developed from an older name, God's Friday. On Good Friday, God's Friday, we proclaim God's purpose is paramount. God was in control at Calvary. The crucifixion of Jesus is not some bad deal that God had to try to make the best of. It was the working out of God's divine intention with a view to a salvation for a doomed creation. The ultimate proclamation of the Apostle Paul's words in Romans known well to us all. And we know that God causes everything to work together for the good of those who love God and are called according to his purpose for them. To be sure, Matthew, Mark, and Luke proclaim God is in agony for his lost creation for its sin. The whole creation is in agony with its creator. The sky grows black at midday. The earth convulses so that even the dead are rousted from their graves. But John, the evangelist whom we know as the writer of the fourth gospel, whose passion account we will read together in just a few minutes, represents the church's longer contemplation on the meaning of the cross. God's agony on God's Friday has purpose. It is not God's response when his son's life went terribly wrong. This story is nothing less than the long-term gift work of grace, God's grace. Make no mistake about it, at every moment in the story, God remains in control, the author and director of the drama of salvation for you and for me. Listen in carefully to John's emphasis in the story of Jesus' passion. Jesus says to the Roman arrest party in Gethsemane, I am the one you are seeking. I told you, I am the one you are looking for. These Roman soldiers are not in charge. Make no mistake about it, Jesus is in charge. Before the powerful Roman governor, Pilate, listen as Jesus speaks with great determination. You would have no power over me unless it was given from above. Later, Pilate reasserts to divine directive when he refuses to reword the placard, Jesus of Nazareth, the King of the Jews. Lean in as Jesus speaks on the cross, addressing his mother, Mary, woman, behold your son. And then to John, his beloved disciple, Jesus says, here is your mother. Jesus will not turn over the care of his mother, nor to the church, to custom, let alone chance. Jesus calls the shots. Even on the cross, Jesus says, I am thirsty. As we listen in deeply, we realize that Jesus speaks not of dehydration, but rather these words are the fulfillment of scripture. And even on the cross, Jesus, as he dies, he proclaims, it is finished. He doesn't say, he isn't saying it's all over now. He is saying more precisely, that which was way far off, namely my wayward children, have been brought near. The purpose of salvation has been accomplished. Jesus, notice, even calls the hour of his death when he will breathe his last. Death by crucifixion results not from the loss of blood, but by suffocation. 
The process can last for days if the one being crucified has strong legs to support the body. John reports that the soldiers expedite the process by breaking the legs of the crucified men to Jesus' left and right, lest they remain on the cross for the Passover and offend the devout Jewish worshipers. But when they come to Jesus, who is young, healthy, and presumably would have strong legs of a carpenter, Jesus is already dead. How could he be dead so soon, except that he remains in control? An answer can be found back in John chapter 10, when Jesus says, I lay down my life in order that I may take it up again. No one takes it from me, but I lay it down of my own accord. I have the power to lay it down and the power to take it up again. I have received this command from my Father. There can be little doubt here. God is in the control of the events of Good Friday. Again and again, the evangelist makes this point. The forgiving agony of God fulfills the divine and eternal purpose of salvation. That is why we can say this Good Friday is God's Friday. And so as we gather to pray on this day, we remember that our God suffered upon the cross, offering himself in intercession for the sake of a hurting, dying world, demonstrating that God's healing love will ultimately triumph. And so as the people of God called to carry out the work of Christ in the power of his Holy Spirit, we do today what the Savior did upon the cross. We offer ourselves in praise to God. We offer ourselves for the sake of the world. We intercede in prayer for all of God's beloved children. And we offer our gifts to demonstrate God's healing power and his compassion. Today, we join with the church throughout the entire world for which Jesus willingly died. We exclude no one from our prayers because the divine love that is revealed on Calvary's mountain knows no bounds. And so today we will pray for all that concerns God, commending everything and everyone into God's hands, trusting that the God who was in control at Calvary is also in control of the world he loves, the world into which he sent his only son, not to condemn, but to save. This is God's Friday. Thanks be to God. Amen.
brothers and sisters, for the Holy Church throughout the world. Almighty and eternal God, you have shown your glory to all nations in Jesus Christ. By your Holy Spirit, guide the Church and gather it throughout the world. Help it to preserve in faith, proclaim your name, and bring the good news of salvation in Christ to all people. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for all church leaders and servants of the various branches of the Christian family tree and for the whole people of God. Almighty and eternal God, your spirit guides the church and makes it holy. Strengthen and uphold our bishops, pastors, other ministers, and lay leaders. Keep them in health and safety for the good of the church and help each of us in our own various vocations to do faithfully the work to which you have called us. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us pray for those preparing for baptism. Almighty and eternal God, you continue to bless the church. Increase the faith and understanding of those preparing for baptism. Give them new birth as your children, and keep them in the faith and communion of your holy church. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the unity of all Christians, let us pray for our sisters and brothers who share our faith in Jesus Christ. Almighty and eternal God, you give your church unity. Look with favor on all who follow Jesus, your Son. Make all the baptized one in the fullness of faith and keep us united in the fellowship of love. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For the Jewish people, let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, long ago you gave your promise to Abraham and your teaching to Moses. Hear our prayers that the people first to hear the word of God, called and you called and elected as your own, may receive the fulfillment of the covenant's promises. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in Christ, let us pray for them for those who do not share our faith. Almighty eternal God, gather into your loving embrace all those who call out to you yet under different names. May they discover truth as they walk before you in sincerity of heart. Help us to practice respect for all your children and make us more faithful witnesses of the love made known to us in your Son. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For those who do not believe in God, Almighty Eternal God, you created humanity so that all may long to know you and find peace in you. Grant that all may recognize the signs of your love and grace in the world and in the lives of Christians and gladly acknowledge you as the one true God. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Let us pray for God's creation. Almighty and eternal God, you are the creator of a magnificent universe. Hold all the worlds in the arms of your care and bring all things to fulfillment in you. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. For all in public office, let us pray for all the nations and peoples of the earth and for those in authority among them, for Donald, the President of the United States, the government of this country, for the Congress and the Supreme Court, for Amy and Tina, our senators, Tim, our congressman, Mark, our governor, and the members of the legislature, for Kevin, our mayor, and the members of the city council, 
county commissioners, law enforcement, police and sheriff, firefighters and first responders, for all who serve the common good, that by God's help they may seek justice and peace and live in peace and concord. Almighty eternal God, you are the champion of the poor and oppressed. In your goodness, give wisdom to those in authority so that all people may enjoy justice, peace, freedom, and a share in the goodness of your creation. We ask this through Christ our Lord. For those in special need, let us pray for those in need. Almighty and eternal God, you give strength to the weary and new courage to those who have lost heart. Heal the sick, comfort the dying, give safety to travelers, free those unjustly deprived of liberty and deliver your world from falsehood, hunger, and disease. Hear the prayers of all who call on you in any trouble, that they may have the joy of receiving your help in their need. We ask this through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. And now, as our Savior has taught us, so we are bold to pray. Our Father, Lord in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Some of you have been with us for our soup luncheons and we've been making extra collections for a young girl in our community, Lul Ahmed, age 13, who was hurt in an accident on the October 17th. You'll read about her in the back page of our bulletin. Today's offering goes to a fund that's been established at First Bank of Faribault, State Bank of Faribault, for her and to support and lift up her family. We have a unique opportunity today to demonstrate the healing power and compassion of Christ. Will you give as God has blessed you?
please join in our greeting. God is light, in whom there is no darkness at all. Jesus Christ is the light of the world. And this is the judgment, that the light has come into the world. And we love darkness rather than the light. The Passion of our Lord Jesus Christ, according to John. Jesus went out with his disciples across the Kidron Valley to a place where there was a garden, which he and his disciples entered. Now Judas, who betrayed him, also knew the place, because Jesus often met there with his disciples. So Judas brought a detachment of soldiers together with police from the chief priests and the Pharisees, and they came there with lanterns and torches and weapons. Then Jesus, knowing all that was to happen to him, came forward and asked them, Whom are you looking for? They answered, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus replied, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with them. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they stepped back and fell to the ground. Again he asked them, Who are you looking for? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus answered, I told you that I am he. So if you are looking for me, let these men go. This was to fulfill the word that he had spoken. I did not lose a single one of those whom you gave me. Then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it, struck the high priest's slave, and cut off his right ear. The slave's name was Malchus. Jesus said to Peter, Put your sword back into its sheath. Am I not to drink the cup that the Father has given me? So the soldiers, their officer, and the Jewish police arrested Jesus and bound him. First they took him to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. Caiaphas was the one who had advised the Jews that it was better to have one person die for the people. Simon Peter and another disciple followed Jesus. Since that disciple was known to the high priest, he went with Jesus into the courtyard of the high priest. But Peter was standing outside at the gate. So the other disciple, who was known to the high priest, went out, spoke to the woman who guarded the gate, and brought Peter in. The woman said to Peter, You are not also one of this man's disciples, are you? He said, I am not. Now the slaves and the police made a charcoal fire because it was cold, and they were standing around it and warming themselves. Peter also was standing with them and warming himself. Then the high priest questioned Jesus about the disciples and about his teaching. Jesus answered, I have spoken openly to the world. I have always taught in synagogues and in the temple where all the Jews come together. I have said nothing in secret. Why do you ask me? Ask those who heard what I said to them. They know what I said. When he had said this, one of the police standing nearby struck Jesus in the face, saying, Is that how you answer the high priest? Jesus answered, If I have spoken wrongly, testify to the wrong. But if I have spoken rightly, why do you strike me? Then Anas sent him abound to Caiaphas, the high priest. Now Simon Peter was standing and warming himself. They asked him, You are not also one of his disciples, are you? He denied it and said, I am not. One of the slaves of the high priest, a relative of the man whose ear Peter had cut off, asked, Did I not see you in the garden with him? Again Peter denied it, and at that moment the cock crowed. Then they took Jesus from Caiaphas to Pilate's headquarters. It was early in the morning. They themselves did not enter the headquarters so as to avoid ritual defilement and to be able to eat the Passover. So Pilate went out to them and said, what accusations do you bring against this man? They answered, if this man were not a criminal, we would not have handed him over to you. Pilate said to them, take him yourself and judge him according to your law. 
The Jews replied, we are not permitted to put anyone to death. This was to fulfill what Jesus had said when he indicated the kind of death he was to die. Then Pilate entered the headquarters again, summoned Jesus and asked him, are you the king of the Jews? Jesus answered, do you ask this on your own or did others tell you about me? Pilate replied, I am not a Jew, or am I? Your own nation and the chief priest have handed you over to me. What have you done? Jesus answered, my kingdom is not from this world. If my kingdom were from this world, my followers would be fighting to keep me from being handed over to the Jews. But as it is, my kingdom is not from here. Pilate asked him, so you are a king. Jesus answered, you say that I am a king. For this I was born, and for this I came into the world, to testify to the truth. Everyone who belongs to the truth listens to my voice. Pilate asked him, what is the truth? After he had said this, he went out to the Jews again and told them, I find no cause against him, but you have a custom that I release someone for you at the Passover. Do you want me to release for you the king of the Jews? They shouted in reply, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a bandit. Then Pilate took Jesus and had him flogged. And the soldiers wove a crown of thorns and put it on his head, and they dressed him in a purple robe. They kept coming up to him, saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and striking him on the face. Pilate went out again and said to them, Look, I am bringing him out to you to let you know that I find no case against him. So Jesus came out, wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Here is the man. When the chief of priests and the police saw him, they shouted, Crucify him! Crucify him! Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him. I find no case against him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has claimed to be the Son of God. Now when Pilate heard this, he was more afraid than ever. He entered his headquarters again and asked Jesus, where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. Pilate therefore said to him, Do you refuse to speak to me? Do you not know that I have the power to release you and the power to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no power over me unless it had been given you from above. Therefore the one who handed me over to you is guilty of a greater sin. From then on, Pilate tried to release him, but the Jews cried out, If you release this man, you are no friend of the emperor. Everyone who claims to be a king sets himself against the emperor. When Pilate heard these words, he brought Jesus outside, outside and sat on the judge's bench at a place called the Stone Pavement, or in Hebrew, Gabbatha. Now is the day of preparation for the Passover, and it was about noon. He said to the Jews, here is your king. They cried out, away with him, away with him, crucify him. Pilate asked them, shall I crucify your king? The chief priest answered, we have no king but the emperor. Then they handed him over to be crucified. So they took Jesus and carrying the cross by himself, he went out to what is called the place of the skull, which in Hebrew is called Golgotha. There they crucified him, and with him two others, one on either side, with Jesus between them. Pilate also had an inscription written, and put on the cross. It read, Jesus of Nazareth, and the King of the Jews. Many of the Jews read this inscription, because the place where Jesus was crucified was near the city, and it was written in Hebrew, in Latin, and in Greek. Then the chief priests of the Jews said to Pilate, do not write the king of the Jews, but this man said, I am the king of the Jews. Pilate answered, what I have written, I have written.
When the soldiers had crucified Jesus, they took his clothes and divided them into four parts, one for each soldier. They also took his tunic. Now the tunic was seamless, woven in one piece from the top. So they said to one another, let us not tear it, but cast lots for it to see who will get it. This was to fulfill what the scripture says. They divided my clothes among themselves, and for my clothing they cast lots. And that is what the soldiers did. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus, where his mother and his mother's sister Mary, the wife of Clopas, and Mary Magdalene, when Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing beside her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his own home. In order to fulfill the scripture, I am thirsty. A jar full of sour wine was standing there. So they put a sponge full of the wine on a branch of hyssop and held it to his mouth. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Since it was the day of preparation, the Jews did not want the bodies left on the cross during the Sabbath, especially because that Sabbath was a day of great solemnity. So they asked Pilate to have the legs of the crucified men broken and the bodies removed. Then the soldiers came and broke the legs of the first and of the other who had been crucified with him. But when they came to Jesus and saw that he was already dead, they did not break his legs. Instead, one of the soldiers pierced his side with a spear, and at once blood and water came out. He who saw this has testified so that you also may believe. His testimony is true, and he knows that he tells the truth. These things occurred so that the scripture might be fulfilled. None of his bones shall be broken. And again, another passage of scripture says, they will look on the one whom they have pierced. Oh, 
after these things, Joseph of Arimathea, who was a disciple of Jesus, though a secret one because of his fear of the Jews, asked Pilate to let him take away the body of Jesus. Pilate gave him permission. So he came and removed his body. Nicodemus, who had at first come to Jesus by night, also came, bringing a mixture of myrrh and aloes, weighing about a hundred pounds. They took the body of Jesus and wrapped it with the spices in linen cloths, according to the burial custom of the Jews. Now there was a garden in the place where he was crucified, and in the garden there was a new tomb in which no one had ever been laid. And so, because it was the Jewish day of preparation, and the tomb was nearby, they laid Jesus there. Thank you for listening to our broadcast this afternoon of the Faribault Community Good Friday Service, brought to you by the Keller Insurance Agency in Nearstrand and by the Pleasant Manor, Pleasant View Estates of Faribault. You're listening to the Mighty 920 KDHL Faribault.